They discussed the account, dropping H's against one another as if for a wager, very friendly. Captain Alastoon paid. I give you a bad discharge, he said quietly. Duncan raised his voice. I don't want your blooming discharge. Keep it. I'm going to have a job ashore. He turned to us. No more blooming sea for me, he said aloud. All looked at him. He had better clothes, had an easy air, appeared more at home than any of us. He stared with assurance, enjoying the effect of his declaration. Yes, I have friends well off. That's more than you got. But I am a man. Your shipmates for all that. Who's coming for a drink? No one moved. There was a silence, a silence of blank faces and stony looks. He waited a moment, smiled bitterly, and went to the door. There he faced round once more. You won't? You bloomin' lot of hypocrites? No? What have I done to you? Did I bully you? Did I hurt you? Did I? You won't drink? No. Then may you die a thirst every mother's son of you. Not one of you has the spirit of a bug. You're the scum of the world. Work and starve. He went out and slammed the door with such violence that the old board of trade bird nearly fell off his perch. He's mad, declared Archie. No, no, he's drunk, insisted Belfast, lurching about and in a maudlin tone. Captain Alastoon sat smiling thoughtfully at the cleared pay table. Outside, on Tower Hill, they blinked, hesitated clumsily, as if blinded by the strange quality of the hazy light, as if discomposed by the view of so many men. And they who could hear one another in the howl of gales seemed deafened and distracted by the dull roar of the busy earth. To the black horse! To the black horse! cried some. Let us have a drink together before we part. They crossed the road, clinging to one another. Only Charlie and Belfast wandered off alone. As I came up, I saw a red-faced, blousy woman in a gray shawl and with dusty, fluffy hair fall on Charlie's neck. It was his mother. She slobbered over him. Oh, my boy, my boy. Let go of me, said Charlie. Let go, mother. I was passing him at the time, and over the untidy head of the blubbering woman, he gave me a humorous smile and a glance ironic, courageous, and profound that seemed to put all my knowledge of life to shame. I nodded and passed on, but heard him say again good-naturedly, If you let go of me this minute, you shall have a bob for a drink out of my pay. In the next few steps I came upon Belfast. He caught my arm with tremulous enthusiasm. I couldn't go with him, he stammered, indicating by a nod our noisy crowd that drifted slowly along the other sidewalk. When I think of poor Jimmy, poor Jim, when I think of him I have no heart for drink. You were his chum too, but I pulled him out, didn't I? Short wool, he had, yes, and I stole the bloomin' pie. He wouldn't go. He wouldn't go for nobody. He burst into tears. I never touched him. Never. Never, he sobbed. He went for me like, like a lamb. I disengaged myself gently. Belfast's crying fits generally ended in a fight with someone, and I wasn't anxious to stand the brunt of his inconsolable sorrow. Moreover, two bulky policemen stood nearby, looking at us with a disapproving and incorruptible gaze. So long, I said, and went on my way. But at the corner I stopped to take my last look at the crew of the Narcissus. They were swaying, irresolute and noisy, on the broad flagstones before the mint. They were bound for the black horse, where men in fur caps with brutal faces and in shirt sleeves dispense out of varnished barrels the illusions of strength, mirth, happiness, the illusion of splendor and poetry of life to the paid-off crews of southern-going ships. From afar I saw them discoursing with jovial eyes and clumsy gestures, 
while the sea of life thundered into their ears ceaseless and unheeded. And swaying about there on the white stones, surrounded by the hurry and clamor of men, they appeared to be creatures of another kind, lost, alone, forgetful, and doomed. They were like castaways, like reckless and joyous castaways, like mad castaways making merry in the storm and upon an insecure ledge of a treacherous rock. The roar of the town resembled the roar of topping breakers, merciless and strong, with a loud voice and cruel purpose. But overhead the clouds broke. A flood of sunshine streamed down the walls of grimy houses. The dark knot of seamen drifted in sunshine. To the left of them the trees and tower gardens sighed. The stones of the tower gleaming seemed to stir in the play of light, as if remembering suddenly all the great joys and sorrows of the past, the fighting prototypes of these men, press gangs, mutinous cries, the wailing of women by the riverside and the shouts of men welcoming victories. The sunshine of heaven fell like a gift of grace on the mud of the earth, on the remembering and mute stones, on greed, selfishness, on the anxious faces of forgetful men. And to the right of the dark group, the stained front of the mint, cleansed by the flood of light, stood out for a moment, dazzling and white like a marble palace in a fairy tale. The crew of the Narcissus drifted out of sight. I never saw them again. The sea took some, the steamers took others, the graveyards of the earth will account for the rest. Singleton has no doubt taken with him the long record of his faithful work into the peaceful depths of an hospitable sea, and Duncan, who never did a decent day's work in his life, no doubt earns his living by discoursing with filthy eloquence upon the right of labor to live. So be it. Let the earth and the sea each have its own. A gone shipmate, like any other man, is gone forever, and I never met one of them again. But at times the spring flood of memory sets with force up the dark river of the Nine Bends. Then on the waters of the forlorn stream drifts a ship, a shadowy ship manned by a crew of shades. They pass and make a sign in a shadowy hail. Haven't we, together and upon the immortal sea, wrung out a meaning from our sinful lives? Goodbye, brothers. You were a good crowd. As good a crowd as ever fisted with wild cries the beating canvas of a heavy foresail, or tossing aloft, invisible in the night, gave back yell for yell to a westerly gale. This concludes the reading of The Nigger of the Narcissus by Joseph Conrad.